any questions about past lectures or homework assignments, like quick questions that we can just get out of the way. Um, anyone? Is that it says new folder? Um, oh, I... Hello. All right, did, did you say something? Oh, yeah, I just had a, are you able to hear me? Yeah, I am, yes. Okay. Um, so I noticed that there's like, um, like, seems to be like two different ways of like, uh, like coding React, there seems to be like a more like functional way and more, mm -hmm. and there's a, like another way, like, where it's more like class related. Um, mm -hmm. Can you like kind of explain like the differences or like how, like what is, I guess like used more in industry and like yeah, just, like, okay yeah. Um, are you talking about the difference between JSX and function based component rendering? Or are you talking about the difference between rendering components as objects versus functions? Um, I just know like components sometimes can be created as like classes and sometimes. Okay, I see what like, you mean. Um, yeah, you use hooks, I guess, to like do stuff. Yeah, like yeah. Um, honestly, it's very much dependent on number one, your use case. So components as classes are much like heavier, like they're a little more um, involved, complicated, but that also means they have more customizations, more features, um, whereas function-based components are very clean. Um, they're portable. They're easy to integrate and use between a lot of pages. So it all comes down to like, let's say in industry, you're working for a company and you're kind of faced with that choice. A lot of times it just comes down to the stylistic choice of the company. So say five or like three years ago when React is first being conceived, there was much more of a distinction because the object-based approach had a lot more features, but these days they're kind of closing that gap. And I think that's a lot because functions come with their own like top level optimizations, their own inherent portability. Um, so I'd say today it's mostly a stylistic choice. I mean, you'll always find an edge case where it differs a lot, um, but you're unlikely to find anything that is crazy different. Um, so I guess that would, that's all, that's to say like, it's up to you. Um, in the club specifically, I've noticed that we prefer a function-based interface. So we prefer to do it all as functions and then only make the top most component, which is like the home page essentially, like the top level HTML tag into a class. Um, you don't have to do that. It's, it's very much up to you, your manager, your PM, your company standards. So it's very dependent on all of that. But um, is it true that like the functional components were like released at a like a later date or I guess like? Yeah, so object-based components are the oldest way because naturally the function of like a tag is conducive to object-based notation. Um, so functions are kind of new on the scene. Um, yeah, but kind of the, the gap between the features that one offers versus the others is closing, I'd say. And if it closes sufficiently, then it would probably be better to use functions because they are like, like they come with a lot of extra optimizations. Cool. Does that Thanks. answer your question? Yeah, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, with that, if there are no other pressing questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will begin the lecture. So I am kind of sad because I had a midterm. I don't know if any of you are taking 61C, but I had 61C midterm on Tuesday during my favorite lecture to deliver. So I hope Alex, Alex was able to show you guys why I like that lecture so much. Um, does anyone have any questions about that lecture? I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, when we were doing like the post thing, uh, when we wanted to add something to like the dictionary or like the mm -hmm. database, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, we were always putting like um, item between uh, codes, uh, like uh, then two points, then like the item you want to add. Are we always obliged to use like the item or no? Are you talking about? Uh, yeah, if you scroll down. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, yeah a bit down in the post request. Here? Uh, no, like what well, I think he was actually like, doing the demo on Postman. Oh, oh, like oh, okay. Uh, so like something like this. Uh, yeah, but like when he wanted to post, he was like putting uh always like instead of title here like item, and it was like uh like item then orange. Yeah. Okay. Um, technically, with JSON, you don't have to wrap the key in quotes. You do have to wrap the item in quotes, but it's safer this way to do it this way. And on the topic of what to call the keys, it's completely arbitrary. Like it's up to the designer how they want to access the keys. And we'll see another example of that as I run through the examples today. Um, So kind of, I guess, keep your question like on the back burner. And then if it doesn't get answered by today, I'd be happy to address it again in the context of today's example. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So today's class is going to be kind of more of a follow along. Um, So I encourage you to follow along. so let's begin. Um, so let's think back to last week. So what did we do last week? The example was to create a backend server that could store data. And that's kind of the topology we see in most cases, is that we want the user to send data to us, which we store, and then we send back to them Maybe we do some transformation on it. Maybe we run some function, machine learning, whatever it is. Basically, the point of web development is to collect data and send it back, uh, at least for apps. That's what we call apps as opposed to like single page websites, which are just information. Um, But apps collect data. And so last week, we saw that data was kind of stored in this JSON object inside of our file. And we use that to access the data again later. Can anyone think why that might be a poor solution to our data storage problem? I smile heavily on participation if anyone's feeling so inclined. Literally take a guess. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, Last week, we stored data inside of a JSON object inside of our code. Why might that not be an ideal solution? Um, is it because if it's only like inside our code, like when we, yeah, basically on like we refresh it, like it's gonna empty it again. Exactly. So when we rerun the code, our JSON object will reinstantiate to nothing, right? Empty, no. So what's the solution? Um, There's a few solutions. One solution is we could write to a file, a JSON file, and we could just keep reading back and forth with that file. But that would get, we can probably guess that that would get pretty unwieldy pretty quickly. So if we have a thousand or 10,000 or a hundred thousand entries, dealing with that in a JSON file would be pretty lengthy. It would take a long time to query. It would take a long time to add would take a long time to do anything really. And to be honest, a JSON file of a thousand or a million entries would probably crash your computer because it's just not built for that kind of scale. And so the solution is a database, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with the concept of a database. For our purposes, you can essentially think of a database as a set of files and in through the database API, remember what the value of an API is, through the database API, the database driver will write to those files and give us back the information we want. And the database itself implements a lot of top level optimizations to make sure that we're able to access data quickly and effectively 
and efficiently without having to worry about how it's stored or anything like that. Okay, so that's kind of the conceptual need for a database. Um, so let's jump into it. All right, so let's remember back to our web server from last time. So we have, we don't need this. We have our express call, our um, use, and then our methods. So before I jump into databases, I just wanna to touch on another important topic which is router topologies. Actually, could you give me one second? Uh, just give me one second. Okay, back to the point. So um, one thing I wanna cover right now is router topologies. So last time we saw an example where basically for every endpoint, we could call a unique method on it. So if we look back, we would have router.get at this, and we'd have router.get at this endpoint, router.get at this endpoint. And then for example, where we had router.id or router.get this, we also had router.post, the same endpoint. And so the question becomes, is there any way to make this structure more effective, more uh, replicable? And so, um, no, I'm about to cover a dot route. That's, that's the point. Um, and so the answer to that is we can create a router and a router is essentially an object which contains all of our endpoints and does what we dictate it to do. Um, sorry, that's kind of confusing, but like, if you think back to um, the last example, we had app.get or app.post. And so we basically tied our entire app to a preset defined set of endpoints. Here, what we're doing is we're creating a new object, a router to handle all of our requests. And we're telling the app, okay, I'm not gonna tie you to these requests. Instead, you can use this router and it will tell you where to go. So how do we do that? Well, first we create a router. This is a standard feature in Express. So we instantiate our router and then router, we call methods to the router. So we say router, if you get this, call this. Router, if you do this, call this. So basically all these methods are not tied to the app at the top level anymore. They're tied to this router. And at the end, we can say, okay, app, from starting from the base URL, append these endpoints via the router. So the router exists as like a fork in our like URL. So let's say we have our base URL, right? And then we say router, okay, start here and then start routing traffic after you've reached this endpoint. So if it's the base URL, right, then the router will handle all traffic versus if I were to say, okay, a router use, let me test this router. So now we will say, okay, after slash test, use this router. And so in that way, one of the main advantages of that is that now we don't have to define all of our endpoints inside this main file. Right before we had app inside the file, and so we had to call dot get dot post all in the same file. Whereas now, if we tie all of our requests to our router, it's an object that we can actually export between files, and so it's a much cleaner organization of our code. And the advantage is that we can, it's modular, so we can switch out routers, we can quickly update routers without changing the entire structure of our app. So in industry, in practice, you can expect to be using a router. The last example was kind of more pedag pedagogical in sense, we're just trying to teach it and you can do it that way. But routers are incredibly powerful tools towards modularizing and organizing your code. Okay, are there any questions about that? <clears throat> 
All right, moving right along then. So in here, I've kind of put um, some, basically I've changed the last example to use a router topology. And one of the other examples of where router comes in handy is that you can chain methods. So before it would have been app.get, then app.put, then app.delete to the same endpoint. Instead, I can just define this endpoint as a route and add methods to it. So another way to organize your code pretty cleanly. All right, are there any questions about that? I see one in the chat. Could you explain app.use? Yes, okay. So app.use, right? Imagine, imagine this, uh, okay. Imagine we have our URL, right? Here we have, let's say we have slash and then A and then slash B, right? So before it would be like, okay, if I make a get request to this URL, then in here somewhere, I'd have to say, please get to slash A slash B. Now, what I have is the router says, okay, the router defines A, B, right? The router defines, for example, here, DB, right? It says, okay, at the DB URL, please call the next thing. So essentially it says app, the app says, all that the app is doing is saying, please apply the router at this endpoint. So everything that comes after this, send it to the router to route the traffic accordingly. So the app has no inherent methods except to tie the router to the base URL. Does that make sense? So if we do not write app.use router, our app will not be connected. That is correct. If you do not connect the router, nothing will happen. It's the same way if you don't connect your Wi-Fi router, do you really expect to get Wi-Fi? Um, we need to make sure that we are actually defining the behavior um, and connecting it up. Okay. Let's clear all drawings. Alrighty. Okay, moving on. So now we move on to database. And the database we'll be using today is MongoDB. So the router does get requests now. Yes. The router routes my request and request type to the function that we want to run. Basically, the entire app is contained inside the router, almost like all the functionality that we're mapping to it is contained inside the router and we can switch out routers if we want to change functionality. Okay. Oh, hello. I don't know why I did that. Okay. So now onto database. So the database we'll be using today is called MongoDB. And MongoDB is what we call a document-based database. And a document-based database is essentially like a big JSON file. So in a document-based database, we basically store data as like little objects. So think of a JSON file, right? You have kind of um, like a, uh, you have kind of a open brace and then a few fields and then a closed brace, right? And so similarly, Inside a document-based database, we basically have a bunch of these little items with fields that we can access. Now, what's the other type of database? We have document databases, and then we have SQL databases. SQL databases are what we call table-based. And table-based databases are more like Excel spreadsheets. They're more like tables. So we have a rigid set of fields and then a rigid number of entries and then we just fill in the according fields. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, which is more used? SQL is certainly older. So SQL is certainly in a lot of legacy systems. But on the other hand, document-based databases are coming up pretty fast. Um, the reality of technology today is, I'm going to be pretty honest with you guys, that it kind of doesn't matter um, 
the gaps between different kinds of technologies are closing so rapidly that it's becoming more of what's easier for the programmer to use and less about efficiency or effectiveness. Both technologies will be extremely effective for your use case. It's just a question of what is more conducive to your type. But in my experience so far, it's been mostly document-based. So Amazon has their own document-based database called DynamoDB. Um, that's a NoSQL database. And so we kind of use that a lot. Not to say that SQL is not used. It's very much up to the client. We use either. And so it's very much a stylistic choice. All right. So is SQL dying out then? No, I would say no. I mean, SQL has its advantages. It's tabular. So a lot of things are quicker, like queries are quicker because you can just search the field vertically. Um, I guess one way it was explained to me is that think of SQL as like an apartment building. So you can keep growing up, right, forever. And like, it's pretty fast to access each building, right? You go in the building and you get in the elevator and you go up. And document-based databases is like a neighborhood. They're separate houses, each with their own features. We can find them, right? We can drive around to those addresses, but, you know, it's, it's, comes with its downsides. And so in the same way, people choose to live in an apartment or house. Similarly, people choose to live in or use Dynamo or Mongo or SQL. It, it's very much about your specific use case, your taste, your style, your um, willingness, and the format of your data a lot of times. All right, so let's go ahead and continue. So how many of you would prefer to do this as a follow along? And how many of you just wanna watch me do it? Um, vote yes or follow along and no for just watch me do it. Okay. Okay, seems like it's just watch me do it, which is perfectly fine. All the examples and code is in the notion. So you're welcome to go back and follow along if you'd like. Um, in that case, I'll skip over this. This is basically how you install it. So we need to first install Mongo, the program itself. And we do that through Brew if you're on Mac OS or however you prefer on Windows. I don't know, I don't give a shit about Windows. Just kidding, don't kill me Bill Gates. Um, yeah, and then this is kind of going into like how to interact with your database directly, which you can do in the terminal. Um, that's less interesting, so I'm not gonna go into it right now. Maybe if we have time at the end, I'll show you guys that. Um, and then also in order to, so we have Mongo downloaded onto our laptop. Like we have the program itself, but we need a defined way to interact with it. And for that, we use Mongoose. So Mongoose is a JavaScript based module for interfacing with MongoDB. And so we use that to carry out all of our requisite operations. Okay, moving on to setting up Mongo. So first we call the package, right? The package will, Mongoose is what we're going to use. So we need to first import that. Then this is where our MongoDB is located. So the way we interface with our database is that the database is basically on a port on our computer and we need to make requests to it in order to change. So this is again, a reiteration of the API principle of they define their behavior and we define ours. So we only interface with Mongoose in this case, who then interfaces with MongoDB, who then interfaces with their internal workings. So this is basically the endpoint to which we make API requests and we don't need to worry about anything other than that. How do we know the port? Um, 27017 is the default port. So if you look up online, you can see like default ports. 
a lot of things have default ports. Um, and so 27.0.1.7 is just what the um, uh, MongoDB designers decided to use as their default port. Um, okay, so then we have, basically we're telling Mongoose to connect to this database. So now Mongoose will interact with our database, which I've called database tutorial. Again, you only need to know this in the setup steps. After this, we're gonna interact with Mongoose exclusively. Um, okay, so then our database is at mongoose.connection. And then this confirms that we've opened our database and this throws an error if we fail to open our database. Um, this is basically setup steps. You don't really need to know any of that. You can always just find example setup steps and copy and paste them. It's very unlikely you'll be using any deep customizations to those. So don't worry too much about knowing all this. Okay, what time is it? I think we'll go for, I'll give this example and then we'll take a short break. Um, so, Oh, actually, let me pause for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Is the server is the server just the same as the first code segment? Sorry, I don't quite understand your question. Uh, Server.js file. Oh, are you asking if this code segment goes into this file? If so, the answer is yes. Yes. So this this will add. So these code snippets are all going to be on the same file. So all of this needs to be defined in the same file. It's one singular program. We've just broken it up here to um, exemplify what we're doing. Can I explain the relationship between the router and MongoDB? There is none. Um, I will explain how we tie those concepts together, but inherently they have no relationship. It's a relationship that we define and I'm gonna show you how to do that. Okay, so how do databases work? So databases are just structured data. It's a way for us to programmatically store our data in a way that makes sense to the database, in a way that's efficient to store, in a way that will keep our data safe. And so when we actually create a database before we start, and this is kind of coming back to principles of design. So with smarter design, we save time, right? So when we create a database, first we want to define what is our data going to look like? And the reason we do this, I mean, there's a lot of reasons we do this, but um, some of the big ones are, it makes the database faster. So the database knows what type each field is and is able to um, basically hash those correctly. That's one reason. Number two is it's secure. So if we try to push incorrect data in the wrong field, our database will throw an error and tell us that this is wrong. So it's unsafe. So our database is type safe. Um, three is security. So by defining what kind of data belongs in each spot, we can check for malicious code. We can check for things that are meant to break our program. And fourth is just, it's easier. So if we define for ourselves exactly what kind of data we're going to be putting into the database, it makes it much easier down the line to like arrange our data and collect data in a way that's conducive to sending it to the database. So how do we do that? Well, we use what's called a schema. A schema is essentially, schema is just a fancy word for a plan or like an outline. And so basically we define an outline that we're going to use and that outline defines how we're going to lay out our data. So here I'm basically saying, okay, Mongoose has a method to create Mongoose schemas. So here we have the schema method and then we're going to define items in our database to have titles, which are strings, tasks, which are strings, dates, which are strings, and an urgency score, which is 
and number, not an integer. Sorry. Um, for this, make sure you guys are consulting the Mongoose documentation. So documentation is probably one of the most essential um, aspects of programming. 90, or I'd say like 85% of programmers don't know how to properly read documentation. And instead they go straight for Stack Overflow or whatever. And Stack Overflow is great, except that it's very unlikely that the issue that you're having, once you get to more involved coding, it's very unlikely that the issue you're having is exactly like anyone else's issue. And so using Stack Overflow, you always run the risk that the solution is either wrong for your case or not optimized for your case. And so understanding and reading the documentation is a critical part of being able to use a program to its maximum effectiveness. So here, I'm going to look at what types can I put into my schema? I can put strings, numbers, dates, buffers, booleans, et cetera. And so if I didn't look here, I might guess that my type is integer, but that would throw an error. And so here I have to have an integer, right? So that's how we define a schema. We pick the name of the field and the type that we can expect to go in that field. Finally, we want to actually define our items. So here we have basically defined item to be a schema. Now we, do, we need to define what will actually be used in that schema. So for this example, we're gonna take our previous example, which was like a general way to store data, and we're gonna make it more specific. So today we're gonna to be making a to-do list via a database. So we're gonna say, okay, for every to-do that I have, a to-do is an item. So a to-do should have follow the item schema. So we can expect a to-do to have a title, a to-do to have a task, a to-do to have a date, a to-do to have an urgency. Now, why do we do it like this? Well, consider if I did this. What if I wanted to have a to don't, right? Then I can define a to don't the same way, right? But it actually serves a different purpose. So that's kind of the way that we, um, that's kind of the reason we keep schemas modular because we want to have a lot of control over types without having to create the new type every single time. Um, I don't know, do you guys know what the number one saying in the Berkeley CS department is? Like number one, they will bash your head over with the sharing. It's dry, don't repeat yourself. If you find yourself duplicating code, rewriting the same line multiple times, doing any of that stuff, you should ask yourself, is there a more effective solution? Is there a more efficient way to do this? Because nine out of 10 times there is. So here, if we didn't have this, we'd have to basically be like, okay, mongoose.model, and then I copy this JSON in, mongoose.model, copy this JSON in. That's not what we want. We want to keep our code as effective as possible. So a model is basically saying, model the to-do item after the item schema. So base the structure of my to-do, my to-dos, base the structure of them on the item, model them on the item schema. Does that make sense? All right, okay, that's a good place to take a five minute break. Um, I forgot to make a Google form. So if everyone could just put their SID into the chat and that's how I'll take attendance today. If you don't put your SID in, you will be marked absent. Okay, I'll see everyone in five minutes. Um, make sure to put in your SID.
Alrighty then, that is five minutes. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started with how do we actually use a database. So we've done all the setup, we defined our schema, we've told our program to define to do's, model to do's based on the item schema. So now we are ready to actually interface with our database. So let's talk about curd. So curd is basically a set of the most basic operations that every database needs to complete. So curd stands for create. Wait a minute. And there's the U. These are out of order. Sorry, guys. But it stands for create, update, retrieve, and delete. So we want to be able to create items, update items, get items, and delete items. You know, very similar to get, put, post, and delete. So we should be seeing the parallels between our, our API endpoints and the database API endpoints. And so what we're about to do is basically like, I like to think of it like weaving. So we have a set of endpoints that are supposed to do something and a set of database operations that can do the thing that we want. So now we need to tie our endpoints to our operations so that we can actually define full functionality for our web app. So we want to tie, if a user says, please post this data, all the user is doing is making a post request. It's our job to take that post request, grab that data, put it into our database. And then if they make a get request, it's equally our job to get that get request, query our database, grab that information and send it back to them. So we are now the middleman between the user and the database that we're managing. So one more time. We are basically our job. We have a set of endpoints, right? A set of places people can make requests and they each have a type of request. We also have a set of database operations that we can do on our database. The user wants to send us data and we need to store that data. So it's our job to tie each of our endpoints to our database operations. So if a user says, please post this data, it's our job to see the post request, see the data, grab that, put it into our database. And then if they want it again later, see their get request, grab that data and send it back to them. So we are interfacing with our database for them. That endpoints are the URLs. Yes, an endpoint is a URL to which we make a request. So this is an endpoint. And this is basically a list of endpoints. So this is an endpoint, this is an endpoint. Okay, so let's start with create. So create is essentially our way of making items. So there's going to be a lot of functions in here that um, you need to understand in order to use the database. But the reality is you don't need to memorize it. And you also don't need this example. If we just go back to the documentation and check in queries, you'll find all of the functions that I'm using here and more. So again, learning how to sit down, read and understand documentation is critical, critical to becoming that next step of software engineer. You know, they're kind of like levels, like there's people who get Google certificates and there's people who do like, you know, Berkeley CS. And then there's people in industry similarly who like, they can code, but not well. And then there's people who can code well, but take too long. And there's people who do this and do that. But if you want to become um, that next level of efficient, effective coder, I highly encourage you to dig into the documentation. Okay, with that said, 
Um, my way personally is through examples. So, sorry, the question was, how do you understand documentation? So when, as you're reading, try it out. There's no harm. Just what's, as you're reading, you know, set up, usually they have a get started section. So read the get started section, copy and paste it into your code. Try running it, try a hello world example. Then as you're reading through, you know, try things. Does not hurt to try. You will very likely not break your computer. So feel free to try as you go. That's really the best way to learn is hands-on. Um, so kind of a mix of the whole like do-it-yourself software ethos with the importance of reading documentation. Okay, moving on. So first we have create. So we need to, um, sorry, I'm missing the instantiation key. Actually, no, I don't think you need this. Uh, you don't need new. We're not, actually, do you? Hold on a second. Back to the documentation we go. Uh, so we have, oh, no, you do, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we do need new. This is real time debugging. Okay, so we have new. So basically, right, um, as an aside, a lot of databases will create their own auto-generated fields. So MongoDB creates this underscore ID field, which generates a unique ID for every single entry, um, which is very helpful. So it's very helpful towards optimizing your program um, to make queries more effective, to make mapping more effective, et cetera. So here we'll be using the ID field because it's easiest, um, but you could also use any of these fields. And that's again in the documentation for how to use these fields to search for items. Um, so let's go back to our actual backend server. So we have a post request, right? Which at the time just wrote to our stupid DB database. Now we need to write to our real DB database. And so let's look at this. So we have router.post. So at the endpoint DB, if we receive a post request, execute this function. So here we have the router, right? Here we're interfacing with the router. We're telling the router what to do. We're saying router, when you receive this request to this endpoint, please do this. Now we need to tie in our database operation. So we have our endpoint. Now we need to tie in our database operation. So we're going to define a new to-do, which is this to-do. And in that to-do, we define each of the fields which we laid out in our schema. So if you remember, our schema was a string, task was a string, date was a string, urgency was a number. So we expect that when we get back a post request, we can expect that that post request will have in its body a title to use, a task to execute, a date, and an urgency. So all we're doing is mapping our users requested data directly to our database schema of our new item that we're gonna put in our database. Then all we have to do is take that new item, that's this item, take that item and save it. And then we basically get this callback, which will send JSON on success. Uh, there should be error handling here. Something like if error uh, res.json uh, status failure else. And then let's go ahead and, uh, all right. Okay, so now that we'll save our item based on the data that the user sent us. Okay, let's try it out in Postman. So I'm going to stop this share, start a new share. Okay, so let's just end this.
session. So I'm going to start node example.js. OK, so we see that our app is listening at localhost 3000. And our database is listening at, this is an alias for localhost, by the way, at localhost 27017. OK, so now if we go to Postman, then we have our simple post to local 3000 slash DB. Here's the item we want to put, right? And so I'm going to make a new item. So what else did you guys have to do today? Homework, I assume. Homework, we'll do cry for 10 minutes. Then get your stuff done, loser. OK. And then we have date. Uh, let's just assume we're, it's already due, because that's how it would be. And then urgency, let's put it at a, a nine. You know, it's important. And then let's make our post request. So we have a post request to the DB endpoint with this data that we want to put inside of our database. Let's go ahead and look. OK, success. So we got a success message with an ID of this. So this is the new ID for the data that we just sent inside the database. And this is the content that was added to the database. By the way, these fields, these three fields, I define them. You will not always get these back. You define what you want to send back. So if we look back at the lesson plan, I defined, please send back static success if it's success. I defined, please send back the ID. I defined, please send back in the body content, the, the body that we just put into our database. So what you send back is very much up to you. And I'll talk a little more about some guidelines that we like to follow for that, but it's basically up to you. Um, so this is an old example. So just kind of ignore this picture, um, but you can do this yourself. Okay, let's continue to build on existing APIs. So now we have retrieve. So retrieve is basically analogous to which HTTP verb is retrieve analogous to? Does anyone want to take a guess? I basically already said it, so. Get, yeah, correct. We're getting or retrieving data. Um, so for that, we have this find option. And this find function basically tells our database to query for what we're looking for. So find with no arguments means that we have no restrictions. So find everything. So this will return a list of all of our to-dos. And that kind of matches up with our all endpoint, right? So before we had get at db all, now we have our endpoint tied to our database functionality. So we have weaved another endpoint in with our database. What's the difference between res.json and res.sign? Uh, res.json is just a convenience method. So it's just a way to send JSON directly instead of having to do some extra work for res.send. Like you have to add headers, I think, or something. Um, res.json is just easier, um, but you can use res.send. Um, okay, so this will return all of our items. So let's look at Postman. Okay, so I'm going to get all. So I make my get request to db all. This will probably throw an error. Did not throw an error. So hallelujah for that. And we see our two items. So this is the one I had before, right? And this is the one I have now. So I have the ID that I returned earlier. Let's look, let's confirm that uh, post, right? So we have this number, right? That looks the same as this number. So this is working. Title is correct. Task is unfortunately correct. Date is correct. And urgency is correct. So basically our database has correctly stored the data that we sent it. Okay, so retrieve works. Um, we can also, instead of having to retrieve all every single time, we can 
find by ID. And when we say ID here, that is referring specifically, specifically to MongoDB's internal ID field. So do not define your own ID field and expect Mongoose to be able to find your thing. This is specifically for this super long and unwieldy ID that Mongo provides for us. So here we have, let's remember that I've changed the layout of this to all call to the same endpoint, but it's basically the same as if I were to say app.get at this endpoint do this. So here we have our get request, right? We have our ID, this is redundant. We actually need this, but whatever, we'll just leave it in. Actually, we'll just take it out. Okay, we have our find by ID. We're gonna call to our ID, which is what we put in our endpoint. And then we basically say, if error, here's our callback function. If error, status is failure, else send back the to-do. So I feel like this is an important clarification. The reason I have rec.params.id here and not like this is because this is how it's defined inside of Mongo, but this is how I defined it in the endpoint. So when we send the request, we need to send the correct Mongo's D, Mongo's, sorry, MongoDB generated ID. So let's look at Postman, right? I'm going to get an ID. Here's the ID for my laundry, laundry item. So if I make this get request, sorry, if I make this get request, I get back my laundry item based on this ID field. So I put in Mongoose's internal ID field and it returned back. In reality, find by ID is a convenience method. This same thing could be done with just find and then ID. Find by ID is just a faster way to do it. So are there any questions about that? I know that's a little bit confusing. <laughs> No? All right, moving right along then. Okay, so we saw that, we saw Postman. Okay, next up in the CRUD, funny, right? In the CRUD methodology is update. So again, we have a find by ID and update convenience method, which is defined in our, defined in our queries in our documentation. So uh, you can probably tell that I'm just gonna skip through it, but find by ID and update is analogous to put. So in our previous iteration, we had a app.put at ID and then it would update the put. So here we have db.id at request, find by ID and update at this ID. Here we have an extra argument and that is we want you to find this ID and then update it with this data. So the way I have it right now, right? My request body is in exactly the same, sorry, is in exactly the same format as our schema. So I've purposely laid it out so that when I make this request, it so happens that I have all the correct fields, right? Here are the fields I need. And here are the fields that I happen to send to the server. So this is a very effective design decision because that way I can just pass body directly to this to update it. Otherwise, if I were to say, let's say I wanted to send it as, oh, hello, don't do that. Let's say I wanted to send it as this, like let's say I wanted to nest JSON and say, okay, here's the full request object. Um, let's say I said, okay, here's the request um, and I wrap it in extra JSON. Then eventually on the other end, I would need to say request rec.body dot, where's that? 
no, rec.body.request. Or if I had, for example, more fields, right? If I had task urgency, if I had, let's say, um, people or related, you know, then we're not following the schema, right? We're not enforcing the schema. So then I would have to do what I did up here, which is extract each field manually. So here, one possible top level optimization, I can just pass rec.body if I promise to myself that I will enforce the body to be in the same format as the schema. Don't do that. It makes it very difficult if you start defining, like if you pass rec.body directly, it's then, if you ever change the amount of stuff you need to put into your request, you will have to redo your entire schema and possibly remake your database. It's better to do it the way I had it like this. This is much safer and much less risky. This way, uh, where was that? This way is risky. I'm just lazy and this is an example. Um, are we expected to be able to write all this code alone after lecture? Um, for the final project, your project should be at least this involved, if not slightly more. Um, I think what we're gonna do is for two lectures from today, next Thursday, I think we're gonna do a lab type lecture. And I'm basically gonna show how to build a website start to finish. So I'm going to show how we connect the front end, how we send front end files, um, specifically in a, in a um, I'll explain more later, but also if I did a lab, how many of you would be interested in coming and sitting in person? Usually I give lectures from Kresge Library. So if you guys are interested, maybe I can make it so that I can be there. Um, okay, we'll talk more about this later and I'll run it by the course staff. Oh, 61B deadline. We can also maybe do it on Friday if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, we can push this down the road. I'll send out an announcement. Um, back to what we were doing. Um, so we're saying find by this ID and update with this new content, which again, this is a lazy way to do it. The proper way to do it is to extract every field and write it into a new to-do object, but I'm really lazy. So let's just ignore that. Uh, and then we have our error handling standard. Okay, finally we have delete. So to delete a to-do, you can probably guess it's the same pattern. We have a find by ID and delete. So same find by this ID. And then we don't need an extra argument because we're just gonna delete that thing. And then we basically get an error or a success. And then we send our error success message. Okay. Very, very straightforward once you get the hang of it. And until then, it's going to be absolutely grueling to learn it. It's a very steep learning curve. Do not be discouraged. Be feel free to experiment until you get it because once you get it, I promise it'll stick. Um, all right, let's just do some Postman testing. Postman is great, by the way. Uh, highly recommend if I haven't made that clear already. Okay, so we have our success, our content. Um, let's try a delete. So we're gonna make a new request. Um, uh, we're gonna do simple, uh, delete by ID. Delete by ID, okay. Uh, we're gonna make a delete request to localhost 3000, oh, hello, localhost 3000 slash db slash this. Okay, so we have, I believe this is the laundry object. So let's delete that. So that's what I deleted. So when we get all again, 
we don't see it. It's been deleted. All we have is the remnant, basically an empty spot. So once we create an ID, we basically create an empty spot. We can delete all the content, but we'll still have that spot. Um, but you can see it's basically gone. Only traces left. So let's look at our final product. OK, we have like 10 minutes, so I'm just going to go over this quickly. Um, we have our Express port and app. We've defined a router now to handle all of our traffic. We have some setup. We have some more setup. Mongo oh, hello. Mongoose setup, right? Mongoose schema, right? Then we have our endpoints, which are attached to our router. So we have our get, our post. I've cut out a lot of the other endpoints because they don't really make sense anymore. These are the important ones, and they kind of show you each of the different um, CRUD operations. So this is all you really need to make a web app work, OK? And then we have our tying our router to our app, tying our app to a port. So the thing I wanted you to kind of see from a design perspective this lecture is that we want to make it so that we tie our endpoint to our database. The reality is all web apps, all of these like fancy things that you hear about everywhere, they're just middlemen. Websites are just middlemen. If you have some cool proprietary machine learning algorithm, that's great for you, but nobody will ever use it if you don't have a website. So it's just a way for us to put ourselves out there. Users will send us data. We take that data, we put it into our thing. Users are not expected to put their data into our stuff. We wouldn't want them to. So our entire job as a server is to take user data, user requests, parse them and tie them to our functionality. And most of the time, that's a database. A database is an extremely, extremely flexible, powerful object for storing data, storing information, images, objects, videos. Everything you see is run by a database. And so interfacing with a database properly is important to creating an effective website. So that's kind of the overview um, or kind of the closing. Um, errors. So I was kind of saying earlier, like last time we were just kind of sending res.json. We can also send errors. So for the failure errors, we can say res.status is 500.json is failure. So res.status is 500.json is failure. Res.status .json. And then we have our res dot, um, if it's a success, we can set our status to 200 or 201 um, and et cetera. And so it is nice to encode data like that into your responses to ensure, reassure the user that they're headed down the right track. Okay, I don't have much more to say about that, but I'm happy to take questions for the next five minutes. Um, but if you're not interested, please feel free to go if you don't have any questions. I hope you guys enjoyed today's lecture. Um, I hope it was a little more interactive today. Um, okay, yeah, if you have a question, feel free to just unmute and ask. Oh, can I have a question? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so like, like it is showing the page when we do what? Um, can you explain more about the column there? Uh, uh, like where? the endpoint, uh, uh, when we do put uh, put requests or delete, yeah, that's the same thing as, uh, in the string. Uh, the endpoint this one? The column. No, like the line as well. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the address. The address. Yeah. Oh, here? Yeah. Yeah. So, basically think of it this way, right? Is that we have our, um, 
like users make requests to a URL, right? I kind of covered that in my node HTTPS lecture. Do you remember that? Um, yeah. And so users make requests to a, a URL, right? And we, the designers of the backend, say that, okay, if you make a, this request to this URL, then my function will execute this thing, right? And so a router is basically just a way to define those functions at those endpoints. It's basically the same thing. It's just a way to do it modularly. So instead of tying our endpoints directly to our app, we define tie them to this router object that we can switch out. Was that your question? Uh, I was asking about the basically the input. Like there's an ID after the colon. Uh, oh, yeah. What colon. if? Okay, yeah. I, what if you I have see. like multiple multiple inputs? Do we? use a yeah. and sig uh, sign or so yeah so i kind of went over this briefly but i think it is confusing so colon is a special way that express specifically defines route parameters so inside of this string when i have a colon in front of a word it's basically telling express like this is a parameter so that's why i'm able to access it here so in our actual request if you look at our request um, we don't have a colon, right? Um, we just have the endpoint. And so it basically creates like infinitely many endpoints and allows us to access those endpoints as a variable. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes so sense. If we have multiple, then we prefer to separate endpoints by slashes. So we would have like slash ID, maybe like slash name, slash whatever. And like we can encode many in like that. Um, or if you have like, I kind of went over this too, but if you have like display preferences, then you can encode them as query parameters. So you might have like max 100 and min like zero or whatever. Uh, so that's kind of different in that these are defined in the URL and this is defined on the server side. Um, and they have different functions. Um, this is kind of less, less fun to use. Um, this is much more powerful, but sometimes it's overpowered. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, Jia Chen, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was I was the one asking the question. I should lower my head. Oh, oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry about I that. I couldn't quite see. No, yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay, anyone else have a question? Ask uh, a question? general yeah, oh. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, my question was like super general, like about the mm -hmm. final project, like will we get mm -hmm. to work with people? Because I know like in the beginning, it was like, is it supposed to be a team project? But I'm not sure if like we changed the agenda or like. No, yeah, it's still a team project. Um, okay. I'm going to be honest, like I loved my final project. And I, uh -huh. to this day, like I, I have a party tonight with the team members I did it with. So oh, I great. really encourage you guys to take take advantage of that. Uh -huh. um, it's going to be really fun. So I hope you guys are looking forward to it. Also, are we still having like the emphasis thing, or is that totally like gone? It is. I'm kind of no, confused. No, we, we are doing that um, because so many people expressed interest in kind of learning both. Like we had a lot of people interested in back end and a lot of people interested in front end. We decided to combine the primary elements of both into one track, and uh -huh. then we have some some split track ones, which we'll kind of get into, but it's like very specific stuff, like very deep into database or very deep into UI UX. Mm -hmm. And you'll get more details about that from Alex later. So don't, don't stress too much about that. Okay, got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? I see one in the chat. Uh, was there no attendance form today? There was not, um if you are here you're supposed to put your id into the chat yeah okay uh all right anyone else uh, i had a question that was like related to the react homework i am limited in my ability to help you uh, but i can try Okay, I mean, it was just, um, I was having trouble like deploying the actual website. Okay, do you know what the error is? Uh, 
Um, so right now I've got it so that like uh, whenever I go to the URL, it it uh, shows me like the README uh, file inside that. Uh, oh, okay. Um, actually, I'm really sorry. I have to go. I realized I have a meeting. Um, please feel free to make a post on Piazza. Okay. I will very much try to get to it tonight. Okay. Um, okay, no, yeah, no problem. I, I'm really sorry about that. No I, I just, my calendar just beeped and I realized I have to go. Um, but yeah, feel free to make a private post. Um, I will um, make sure somebody addresses it. Um, I'll Sounds good. Thank let you. someone in core staff know. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry, guys. If you had a question, feel free to DM me on Slack. But I do have to go um, see you guys next week. <laughs>